connection. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry that I had a technical glitch. This was supposed to be live, and I think it might be disappointing to some of you who are planning to ask questions. I have to figure that out, and we'll go back and do it again. I'm Billy. I'm the host of Show and Tell, and welcome from this beautiful sunny day in Manhattan. Today, I have one of my European guests I'm so pleased to introduce you to. And she's going to show us some really sensational vintage knitting and a variety of other things. So don't go away. I have so much more to say, but I'm going to save it for another episode because this one's going to go pretty long. So the usual things, please hit the subscribe button and ask for notifications by using the top bell. Find me on Instagram where I'm Billy Toy and Ravelry, also Billy Toy. And as usual, I'll put that on the screen. And I think without further ado, I'm just going to go right into introducing you to my guest. So let me welcome you as my guest. I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. Is it Kati or Katie? Uh, in German, you would say Kati. And you say Kati? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so meet Kati and tell us where you're um, coming from today. I think you're in Germany. And mm -hmm. then I'll start to ask you some of my usual questions. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Um, I come from Germany and uh, I live in the middle western part of Germany, near Cologne, uh, that is about 45 minutes away. I live in a, in a city called Wuppertal, um, which is famous for its suspension railway. I don't know if you have heard about it. No. Now, it was built around 1900, so it's over 100 years old. And uh, you have wagons who um, yeah, suspend from a railway. And I have a little model here to show how it works. <laughs> um, and um, it is really nice. It goes through the whole town and uh, is over a river. So when you sit inside, you uh, are in this little wagon and then uh, it goes in the air over the river and you can uh, watch the town on the sides and the river. Um, down. That's really nice. Wuppertal is a town that is really green. Uh, I think it even is, uh, said it's the greenest town in Germany. Wow. Um, it has man many public uh, parks. Um, it has, um, yeah, it's also called the San Francisco of Germany because we live in a valley and so it's on the sides, it's always up and down and uh, you have many roads that go all the way. Believe it or not, I have seen one of those suspension bridges in Porto, Portugal. Hey. And it's considered an engineering marvel. It's really very interesting to see that tram when it arrives, a little train when it arrives, because it's almost like a ferry boat where people put their cars on it and then they, they drive their cars off of this train that has um, gone over, I think it's a river there too as well. Anyway, very interesting. And I'm glad you explained a little bit about your town. I'd love to have my guests talk about Mm -hmm. where they live in case we as tourists someday can travel again to such places. Yeah, Wuppertal is a great place to travel to. And then you can stop and um, walk to, uh, not that walk, but uh, drive to Cologne. And uh, that's also near. I'll get the proper spelling from you and I'll, I'll put it in the notes below. So yeah. if people are looking for it. I'm, I'm sure that people are just chomping at the bit to know about your fabulous, fabulous sweaters. So before you show us what you brought today, I, I wanted to say that Kati's Instagram page reads like a fashion magazine. Every single picture is stunning, 
styled magnificently. The lighting is perfect. I don't know if you have a professional photographer, but there's no loose ends. Everything is neatly tied together and it's just perfection to look at. So people might already know some of your work, but I thought that I counted at least 50 sweaters. Do you have a count? Do you know how many sweaters you have knit? Um, um, I have for Instagram, I have uh, placed all the pictures in a photo album. So it's also a collection for me to look up things. And uh, I also wanted to organize them according to the decades they are in. Uh, so it makes e it easier for me to, to see them. And I think I counted over 100. Over 100. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> okay, so start with the one that you're wearing and the one that's on the mannequin behind you. And then I want to talk about some of the other things that you collect. Yes, I have decided to wear a 1940s bolero jacket. Uh, maybe. So with a matching belt and a matching cap. And I um, like this one very much because uh, it was uh, from a magazine that um, is typical for wartime because you can use um, leftover wool or um, wool that was unraveled mm -hmm. and um, make something new out of it. Um, and since my Instagram name is 20 to 40 style, I wanted to show you all different uh, decades from the 20s, the 30s to the 40s. Okay. And this was my choice for the 40s because I think um, in most parts I wear 1940s, uh, although I like the other styles also very much. But Are you wearing vintage every single day, all the time? Um, I, um, I don't wear original uh, items every day, but I style the way because I think um, my original clothes would be to um, most to I treasure them too much to wear them every day because uh, they get worn out if you wear them day on a daily basis. So I use the self-made items um, or I buy something that looks alike, like vintage. It's amazing. It's amazing. I think there are many people today, which is mind boggling, who have a very vintage lifestyle. Some of my other guests fall in that category as well. I'm a wannabe still. I'm, I'm working on my vintage wardrobe and <laughs> trying to knit more vintage, more and more vintage all the time. Okay, so on the mannequin, this looks absolutely dazzling, <laughs> spectacular. <laughs> Gorgeous. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, ha. Okay. Ha. yeah, this was my uh, latest uh, um, knitting, knitting um, project. It's a jacket uh, from the late 1940s. And I have also knitted a cap and a scarf and uh, gloves to match it. <laughs> um, the um, accessories are from another magazine than the jacket was. Um, the jacket is from this magazine, which uh, has a lot of uh, nice um, items in it. And uh, yes, yeah. ah, this would be the jacket. Um, Yours what, looks much more beautiful than that one because your color choices are very pretty. In, in the original pattern it states it should be brown and yellow, but I like the pink and black choice yeah. better. Stunning. Now, I saw that the gloves, they pass by very quickly. The bottom is black and the top yeah. is pink. Yeah, and this is something I've knitted from an English pattern book. 
Um, complete home knitting illustrated. I've seen this. I've seen this image. Ah, okay. And um, this would be the one with the gloves and the hat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've had a, uh, added a scarf because I thought it would be nice to also have a, a scarf to have a complete set, just not only the gloves to go with. Um, this one is in a cable knit. I don't know if it's well, if it shows. Yes, you can see it. Oh, cool. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I just um, used uh, the same um, with the scarf. Wonderful. Yeah, it's, um, I always um, create these access uh, accessories if I have left over wool. Usually it's this way I buy something for a jacket or a cardigan or a jumper, a sweater, whatever. And then uh, if something's left over, I think, what can I do with it? And then usually a cap or... <laughs> That's a really good tip for people. Instead of playing yarn chicken, buy extra yarn, knowing that you'll make a hat or gloves or something else with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these two um, items I showed would, would be 1940s. Okay. Yeah. And the next, then we could go to the 1930s. Okay. Way back. <laughs> back travel. We're going back in time. Yeah. Uh, for the 1930s part, I have picked up an item that I've got from a French magazine. A really lovely French magazine that um, has a lot of colored pictures, and I love colored pictures. Um, How many languages do you speak? So far, I've seen French, English, and German. Um, French only translation, as uh, translating it, not speaking it, just reading, and uh, with, a with the help of a dictionary, and English and Latin, but that was in school back then. <laughs> <laughs> and many years ago, but that's all. I'm. I don't think that I'm really good with languages. Uh, in fact, when I was in school, English was the first language I skipped <laughs> because I hated English. And now I uh, I've written books in English, <laughs> which I have would have never thought of. <laughs> yeah, I would say most people would be impressed that you can speak German and English because a lot of us are fluent in but one language, especially oh. if my French is from Sikomsa. I can carry on a little bit, but German, I'll be the same, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's very common in schools that you learn English and at least uh, another language. So English for all, and most of the uh, kids also learn a second language, which is usually French or um, uh, Latin. Um, but you can also choose Spanish is uh, becoming more and more popular here as a second language to learn. And yeah, that's this one. I don't know if one can see it. It's this red one. Mm -hmm. I have knitted it in green because I wanted to have more green items in my wardrobe. I love green. So, um, I've picked this up. Uh, I've added original buttons, which is always nice to have. And what I like, and this model is that it has these interesting um, parts with the uh, um, dark green parts. I don't I... even know what you would call that. Maybe someone knows and they'll put it in the comments. Yeah. I've also um, have pictures. I could share the screen so people could see in more detail. Okay. Yeah. It would be this one here mm -hmm. 
and I especially liked this part with the, um, yeah, whatever it's called. Yeah, it's very interesting detail. Yeah. That's, that's the wonderful thing about vintage patterns. I'm working on one now, it's from the 50s, but the way the collar happens, it's asymmetrical, so it's really only collar on one side and it's a deep collar. Just figuring out what the pattern was telling me to do didn't really become apparent until I was there at, at that place. So, and it's parts like the collar is a separate add on thing. So whenever there are these unusual details that we don't see in contemporary clothing, it makes it very fascinating, doesn't it? Yeah. And that is also why I really love the 1930s fashion because they had so many lovely details from the sleeves and um, yeah, the abstract um, patterns with geometric things um, that I think is, is really nice and something you wouldn't see in modern clothing. Right. Very interesting. For this one, I've also had um, added some accessories, which can be seen here. Oh, lovely. Now, the vintage clothing that you yeah, was, um, are you just lucky that you step into them and they fit you perfectly? or? Do you have a really good seamstress or do you do it yourself to get things to fit perfectly? I have really good luck that I have a common vintage size. I think most of the patterns that I find are my size. So um, I usually don't have to change much. This is very, very, very practical <laughs> indeed. But with a vintage pattern, you all open. Sure. Hmm? I was going to, not the knitting, but the, the garments that you're buying. I, I assume that you're finding things online or at flea markets or vintage shops. Like this dress, it's vintage. It happens to, yeah. to fit me reasonably well. I'm not a very tiny size, mm -hmm. what most vintage clothing is. But I know that there are people who bring their things to dressmakers to have them altered so that they fit perfectly. So not just your sweaters, which you're lucky that you're the size that a lot of the patterns call for, but the clothing that you purchase ready-made, does that also fit you because you're that size? Or do you have things taken um, or let out? Yeah, um, I have issues with modern clothing because they don't fit very well, especially trousers. I usually have always problems with the hip and the waist part. So the old uh, patterns fit me much better, but I also sew and um, I, if something isn't perfect, I just change it. That is something I uh, learned very early when starting vintage clothing that I had. Um, if, if I find something and it doesn't fit well, well, I get it fit, fitted because it's so hard to find things. You, you take everything you, you um, find, especially back then when you only had flea markets to go uh, or a secondhand shop, but uh, couldn't buy worldwide in the Internet. Because when I started with vintage fashion, that was about huh, 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah, and um, there was um, nothing I could really find um, um, except on flea markets. And in Germany, you would usually find um, the best would be a black dress, but you wouldn't find fancy uh, colored. Uh, stuff that's something I only uh, found when the internet came along and it was possible to buy on uh, American eBay, but uh, it was most difficult to find anything here. Maybe in Berlin or in Vienna, there were secondhand shops where you could find things and they also bought uh, in uh, the USA <clears throat> for the more fancy stuff, but that's well, how I you get vintage clothing. And when I know later you're going to show us some of your shoes or your 
whole shoe collection and I saw that some of them are American shoes by Magnum, I, I think it was. So anyway, let, let's carry on with the sweaters for now. You have more that you want to show us? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Um, um, da, 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 da. And okay, I just um, for being complete, <laughs> show the hat. Um, I've cro um, cro crocheted it uh, and also the flowers. And, uh, and I also added a little purse. Oh, very sweet. Yeah, and the, these are vintage items, gloves, 1930s gloves, and a pair of matching earrings um, in, in the screen mm -hmm. setting. And these were actually the ones I wore on my wedding day. <laughs> Oh. So they are very special to me. Um, so then from the 30s, I thought we could go to the 1920s. It is most difficult to find anything from the 1920s. So, so in general, you have to sew it or knit it. And I choose to knit it. I um, want to show in this case, um, yeah, a complete outfit with a sweater and a skirt. And maybe I can share it on the screen first. Okay. So you have an impression how it will look. Um, it is this one. Yeah, I really, really liked um, the design with, with the um, yeah, geometric. Yeah. Uh, stuff which is so 1920s and so article. Interesting is this little pocket here where I was wondering why was there a pocket and it's uh, probably for watches, for a little pocket watch. And the uh, accessories I've made for this one, because I had some leftover wool, is this here. Um, it's um, a cap and the purse is my own design. I thought it would be nice to match this is, um, design here. The whole ensemble is from a German magazine, once again. Yeah. Um, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. That's this one from the 1920s, and it has this pattern and a lot of other patterns which I have already knitted or uh, crocheted. Yeah. One is more spectacular than the next. Yeah, it's, it's really nice to have this option to, to get vintage clothing um, and um, yeah, get it in the way you want it, in the colors you want. I know sewing is also uh, um, a way to get it, but I like knitting more because, because it's less messy. And I think it's a little bit easier because the, uh, the, the knitting is more forgivable if it doesn't fit properly and you can always get something in or out and See how it needs to change. Yeah. I know that you collect a wide variety of things, but beyond your shoes, what other categories do you collect? Oh, <clears throat> this is um, really difficult because my husband and I are um, we are sh share the same interests, and we collect a lot of things. We have our um, um, house uh, styled uh, in 1920s to 1940s, um, more or less complete. Uh, and then we uh, collect, um, I collect, okay, all kind of clothing, of course, from hat and uh, accessories, from shoes, um, hats. Uh, we also collect um, shellac records. Uh, I don't know how it's called. Um, the old big uh, record 
records oh, for bigger, the, than, bigger than an LP, bigger than vinyl, something larger? No, 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 the uh, 78. Um, oh, okay. okay. Okay, it's it's called a shellac and shellac records in, in German. We shellac vinyl, but maybe there was something before vinyl. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, then, oh, it's really difficult. Um, yeah, what have we? Okay. A lot of hmm? decanters, like bottles for alcohol. No, mm, no not so <laughs> much. No, 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 that not. But a lot of other stuff, uh, old radios. Um, <laughs> Um, and then uh, a lot of um, things from the wartime, which I find very interesting. For example, um, kitchen tools that were made out of uh, wartime things like a steel helmet or a gas mask uh, switched into a milk um, bottle. So How these I know that you have some fascination with the American military. Can you tell us about that? You know, I knew that you were German and I thought she has these American military uniforms and she's written a couple of books about this. It was a disconnect for me because it's not pleasant to say, but we were enemies. What's the fascination with the American military? Um, okay, first of all, there is, uh, when I grew up, there was a, uh, a great admiration for everything American. American was um, always admired and was a thing to be, it was a stylish. I grew up watching the old Hollywood mu uh, movies, which was uh, shown on German TV. Um, I uh, heard rock and roll music all day long because my father is a great rock and roll fan. Um, and um, so I admired American things a lot. We also have uh, some relatives in America um, who moved for my, uh, for my grandma's father moved um, to America and um, there are still some relatives living there. Okay, so, so hold on one second. I want to share my screen. I have something to share with you. So, ah, okay, yes. <laughs> okay, so wow. on, on the left is my stepmother who served mm -hmm. in the Persian Gulf during World War II. And I know that you'll recognize this as an army uniform. She was a nurse. Mm -hmm. And yeah. on the right is one of my mother's first cousins. She was a captain. I believe this is also army. She was not a nurse. Yes, she was in the Signal Corps, as far as I can see. Probably, I think she's a, a WAC, a Women's Army Corps. Unfortunately, both of these women are deceased, but they had very rich lives. The one on the right, became um, involved in real estate in New York City, commercial real estate, and she had a very successful career. And the one on the left, mother to three children, she did some private duty nursing um, and traveled the world. So I thought that you would enjoy seeing these because I know on your website, which I will put in the show notes so that other people can partake, mm -hmm. you have a lot of this insignia um, shown. So, you know, people have a lot to learn if they are interested in that topic. Yeah, yeah um, in regard of the uniforms, I actually started collecting uniforms because I found a Navy Waves uniform, a US Navy Waves uniform on German eBay and didn't know what it was. And then I started to research because um, I'm a studied historian. And so this is something I like, <laughs> researching things. And I found out that the uh, woman who had this uniform was an aviation uh, mechanist's mate. 
And I found this so interesting because it's um, not well known that uh, women did uh, work in such capacities mm -hmm. during the war. And I started to research and find out more about this uniform. And while researching this uniform, I stumbled over other uniforms. And um, this somehow um, ended in a very large collection and in a website where I shared my, um, my research and what I found out. And in the end, it also um, led me to um, yeah, write books about this topic. And ha, of course, this is the occasion to show you. Uh, so far, I've written two, one, uh, two books. And the first one is dedicated to um, the military nurses in World War II, because these were the first um, serv uh, women services who were uh, militarized, who received military status during the war. And um, this covers uh, the army nurses and the navy nurses, as well as a group that is not known to many, but wore the same uniforms as the army nurses. It's um, American hospital dietitians and physical therapists. Mm. Yeah, and I've um, in these books I always have one part where I tell what these ladies did, what was their job, how. Uh, difficult it was to get them accepted as part of the military. They, in, in the beginning, they were not paid equally and uh, they didn't have the rank and uh, although they had the danger because they were also uh, shipped to combat zones and had uh, to work not directly in fighting but behind the lines in a certain area, um, a few miles behind the scenes, but it would could be dangerous, and some even became prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was a very dangerous job they did, and I was so impressed. And what I found very interesting is also how the uniforms were developed at that time, because um, it was um, for men uh, a very it was kind of unthinkable to have women uh, women wear. Uh, slacks or trousers because th they would be too mannish and so it took a long time until um, women and during the war got um, work attire that would really fit the occasion. So uh, at the beginning they got uh, all the skirts and uh, shoes with heels and um, until um, they finally got really working uh, clothing and it was also interesting what I found so, so nice to read is that um, male tailors made designed the uniforms and they had no experience whatsoever in how to make women's garments and the result was that a lot of them were completely ill-fitting because they forget that women have different bust sizes, that they have hips and that they might have a smaller waist than the hip and they cut it everything straight and, and um, use stiffening like, like they did with men's wear. And this didn't drape well with, with uh, female undergarments. And it was really interesting for me to um, research all this. That was still the case, by the way, in the 19, late 1970s when I worked on Wall Street, there weren't a lot of women professionals. And I wore a suit to work every day and there weren't suits available for women as there are today. So I went to a men's shop and I would take the small jacket, they would tailor it a little bit and then they made a very simple skirt. That was all they could do, a very simple skirt. We weren't wearing pants just yet. Actually, during my career, I never wore pants to work. Um, I ended my career in 1983, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you just doesn't look that uh, in any way. Uh, oh, no, I mean, I was still very young, but I decided okay. I, I decided to start my own business at that point. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I, I had a career of a sort. I was an engineer and I worked with a lot of men. 
um, <laughs> naturally. Um, but it's interesting from the war until the late 70s, it was still the case that there weren't such suits available widely for women. Today, mm -hmm. it's a very different story. And the heels, the heels. I know that my stepmother, I mean, I've seen pictures of her traveling to foreign destinations and with my dad, always a heel. I mean, today when we're tourists, we're wearing the most comfortable, cushiony, flat shoes that we can find. She had her heels. So old habits die hard, they say. <laughs> But that was also a problem do you, during uh, World War II because the women were used to wear high heels and then they got shoes that were with flat or medium heels and they had problems to get used to that because they already, the, the muscles were shortened. And, um, well, speaking uh, of shoes, are you prepared to show us your shoe collection? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, for this, I am already sitting in the right place because behind me uh, are hidden uh, is one of my walls of shoes, which I... Walls. Is there more than one wall of shoes? I've got another one. Okay. Um, that, uh, this is a wall and the other is, uh, with, um, is kind of a shelf, a high shelf where I have my shoes with, with the flat heels or the medium heels. And here are my high heels because they were the only ones that fit into this um, space. <laughs> okay, go ahead. It's amazing. Brace yourselves, everyone. Okay. Um, so no one can see it. Yeah, um, in the back is um, a wall of shoes. And it was the idea of my husband to make this jealousy, to get it up and down. And uh, <laughs> I think. Brilliant. And they're organized by color, it looks like. <laughs> how, many, how many pairs are on that wall? Do you know? Have you counted? Um, I think I have counted once, but uh, I've forgotten. I think about 120, 130 pairs. And it's, <laughs> you're very fortunate that you have just the right size foot, like Cinderella, that fits into this perfect slipper. Yeah. I have a hard time getting contemporary shoes that come in a myriad of sizes and widths. I have a hard time finding any kind of a heel that's comfortable these days. And here you have 120 plus the other thing that we're not seeing. So lucky you, lucky you. I'm very envious. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, shall I show a few? I shoes? think it would be wonderful, especially if there's something that's, you know, a favorite or a special color that's hard yeah. to find or whatever you want to show us would be fabulous. Okay. Uh, I have a pair here that is from the other um, board. That, um, this is a French shoe from the war time. It is the, the complete sole is made of wood and it has some kind of, I think, uh, from rubber, tie, from a tire, mm. the, the rubber. I don't know if one can really see it. And um, this is so, this is what I find so, so interesting in, in vintage garments, how they try to make uh, things out of nothing during the war time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's still stylish. It has this kind of, um, how you call this kind of chair. Um, a rocking chair. Yeah, a rocking chair to make it easier to walk in it. And this is one of um, the things I um, treasure in my collection. And then...
I've got this pair. It's uh, from the 1930s. And when I bought it, it was stated that it belonged to an actress named um, Ida Lupino. Oh, sure. Yeah. Her name comes up in crossword puzzles all the time. Ah, okay. <laughs> Ida Blank. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, she played with Humphrey Bogart, and uh, I like her very much, and this is so special to have something like this. Of course, you never know if it's really true, but um, it was sold from her estate, and inside the shoes you have Los Angeles, Hollywood, um, so I think it's very probable that she wore these shoes. Are they barely worn, or were they barely worn when you got them? Because I wouldn't imagine that these stars wore anything more than a couple of times. Mm, yeah, I think it's normal. It's not uh, not worn, but it's uh, in a very good shape. Mm. <laughs> And of course, I like fancy stuff. Uh, for example, <laughs> shoes like this, with uh, the studs here, and uh, these big bow, which, um, yeah, I, I like unusual things. <laughs> wow, I've never seen anything like that. Or, this is a, a shoe from um, Germany. It's ein deutscher Luxus shoe from the 1930s. I love it. Love, yeah. love, love. It's, is it suede? Yeah. With leather straps woven through? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was um cut out and then woven with a uh, white um patent leather no, not patent leather normal leather yeah regular leather yeah I think these shoes are also so beautiful. They have um, this nice design here on the front, but it also repeats here in the heels. Wonderful. What is that? Is it leather that's cut out or are they feathers? What material is that? Um, that is um, embroidered and oh, it's just, um, yeah. Um, a go kind of golden yarn and uh, again um, golden colored studs and the strap goes around the ankle so yeah yeah oh. and it usually has a little stretch here in the back so it's more comfortable there are also shoes with the ankle strap which haven't got the rubber and then they are usually rather uncomfortable to wear if it doesn't give a little bit uh, mm -hmm. to be more flexible. Yeah. You are interested in more shoes? <laughs> in um, well, I mean, of course, I'd love to see every pair, but I, I think that's probably a good amount to have shown. Yeah. In regard of knitting, I've also um, picked up uh, something that would be nice to show this is um, a book with samples of yarn. Oh. You can clip it uh, out and then oh, you have lots of little pieces showing the little uh, the, the different colors and see how thick they are or how thin and the materials are also mentioned. I've also taken photographs, which might be a bit better in the quality. I could share the okay. screen, yeah? Mm. 
the colors look much brighter than I would have expected. Yeah, I uh, they are up to neon, nearly neon colors. I feel so badly for the people who showed up live. Yeah. I wonder if at the end we might try just so I'll know for next time. Yeah. Oh, that's that's perfect. That's great. Now yeah, okay. they, okay. they, they look fresh like they were manufactured yesterday. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And you also see these um, multicolors in two shades together. Like a barbershop pole. <laughs> Yeah. What an interesting thing to have in your collection. Mm -hmm. I've actually got another one, but this is a nicer with more samples in it. And do you know what year approximately this is from? Um, I think it's about uh, 1933, 19, no, 1936, 1937, according to the pictures unbelievable it looks brand new unbelievable it also contains a couple of um, knitting patterns <laughs> and it's a, a german one but one can see this and when you read in one of my earlier episodes i did a, a piece on sweaters in the collection of the metropolitan museum of art and in those, you could see some of the old colors of the yarns. But this is a very special thing to have. <laughs> I'm so glad that you agreed to come on and share all these many treasures with us and to share yourself. I, I, I mean, each of my guests holds a special place in my heart. And I just hope <laughs> one day that we'll all be able to meet some yes, person, wouldn't it be wonderful? If you don't have anything else that's special or you know that you're dying to show us, I think this is a good place to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, I would have uh, thousands of things I could share. Um, I've got uh, quite an amount of knitting magazines and fashion magazines. I have collected Sears catalogs. Um, yeah. So buttons and uh, buckle belts. And <clears throat> so <laughs> I could just um, thank, you ever, thank you ever so much for sharing everything with us. Bravo. <laughs> Have you oh, thank you. <laughs> I really enjoyed coming to your show. Okay. <clears throat> before, before you go, let me see if I can get it to go live not that there would be anybody there but i'm just curious yeah we, we can try this out